In this video, I want to have a more complete and in-depth discussion regarding uh, the Western blot analysis, a classic technique for uh, protein detection and measurement. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Anwar Youssef Dunbar, and this is Big Discussions 76, Science and Technology. First of all, please like this video, please share it, and please subscribe to my channel. If you haven't, uh, definitely uh, subscribe with each passing day. I am inching closer and closer to uh, the holy number of uh, 1,000 uh, subscribers. And once I get there, uh, you know, I'll have a super chat when I go live, but also I think the most important thing uh, is that I'll have a community tab and I'll be able to share more information and more um, facts and articles and principles of science once I have that community tab. So if you haven't, please hit that uh, subscribe button. So in this video, I want to have a more complete and in-depth discussion uh, about the Western blot analysis, uh, a classic technique for protein detection and measurement. Several months ago, I uh, created a live stream uh, regarding uh, part one of my uh, graduate thesis. So since I started this channel and I started creating content over here, uh, I've um, touched on numerous topics, science stories, uh, whether it be uh, the uh, world event that's going on now. I'm not going to say what the world event is because, as you know, uh, YouTube uh, temporarily took my channel down for talking about aspects of that world event. But I've talked about that world event. Uh, yeah, it's August 2021 for people who watch this in the future and you know and you need some context for what I'm talking about. I've talked about that world event. I've talked about uh, smaller uh, science stories, uh, including um, things like Gorilla Glue. Uh, I've talked about, at a high level, uh, what pharmacology and uh, toxicology are. Uh, and I've had guests over to talk about things like epidemiology and uh, gene editing and uh, CRISPR and aerospace. Um, but I wanted to, at some point, get into the meat and potatoes of my training uh, because shout out to the scientist uh, supreme Nicole many of you know her as Nicole I'll just leave it there but um, on her channel she's um, she's done a good job presenting actual data to um, her audience and I wanted to incorporate some more of that into my channel so I thought it would be nice to go over um, parts one and two of my graduate thesis I did a live stream on part one, uh, and I realized uh, when I was doing that, I tried to break it down, and I tried to make it as understandable as possible for uh, my audience, but uh, with um, uh, much of my audience being non-scientists, I understand that uh, a lot of that may have gone over people's heads, and people, um, I may have lost people once I started talking about uh, techniques and my actual research project, but I thought it was important none um, the less. And I do plan to um, do a live stream on part two of my graduate thesis because there, there was a part two. In any case, uh, after I uh, created that live stream, I went back and I cut pieces of it out Focusing on the techniques, um, if you want to um, go back and listen to what the entire part one of my graduate thesis was about, you can do that. And I may uh, create more content going forward elaborating on the project, but I wanted to start to get knowledge of the techniques uh, out there. And one of the techniques that I just um, cut out and uploaded was that of the uh, Western blot analysis. And it's funny, you know, when you're uh, recording things, especially when you're recording them live, you're, you're doing it on the fly and you don't 
always do things in the most complete way. So when I cut that piece out and uploaded it, I said, oh, geez, I left out some key points about uh, the Western Bloc analysis, um, things that my peers might uh, look at this and say, you know what? He didn't mention this, he didn't mention that, he didn't mention that. So in this video, I want to go back and fill in some of those gaps and give a more uh, complete um, discussion of um, what the Western Bloc analysis is and why it's important. So before I dive into the meat and potatoes of the Western Bloc analysis in a more complete and in-depth way, I, I want to say a few words about why this, this is important. Uh, well, as you know, this is a science channel, so over here I'm going to talk science. Uh, but I realized that for um, the layperson listening to some of this stuff, uh, it might uh, start to sound like gibberish after a while, and that's actually a challenge for the, the science community, and that is making it understandable and uh, digestible for uh, the non-science uh, populations. So, why is this important and who is this for? Well, I think it's important for uh, general knowledge. Um, this is uh, for uh, just the generally curious person because there are uh, generally uh, or should I, should I say genuinely curious people out there uh, of different trainings, of different backgrounds who um, want to learn more about science. Uh, for a time, I was actively volunteering over at the David M. Brown Arlington Planetarium, uh, which, and most of the science over there, dealt with aerospace and astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, but many of the people who were going over there and volunteering and going over there and listening to the, the talks and watching the full double shows were people who were just curious to learn more about uh, science, um, physics, astronomy, astrophysics, and those kinds of things. So, th so this is for curious people. Uh, it's also for aspiring scientists. Uh, there may be uh, young people out there who have an interest in science and in, in this instance the biomedical sciences and there are many disciplines underneath that umbrella but they may find this interesting and then finally uh, the layperson in uh, the general public um, and in some instances well in many instances it's important for individuals in the general public um, and the general population to understand science in the this current world event that we're going through right now um, one of the questions early on that emerged uh, was how accurate are are the assays for detecting the uh, the contagion that's floating around right now so there was a lot of a lot of talk about PCR and probes and what those assays um, are and how they work and how accurate are they so in many instances when world events like this take place, it's important for the general public to understand what's going on uh, when they're listening to CNN and MSNBC and Fox News or uh, if they're watching <clears throat> Dr. Anthony Fauci or whomever on TV, it's important to understand what's being said. So, uh, and in some instances, I'll, I'll end with this, uh, for uh, the legal sector, for uh, law firms, if they're involved in some sort of litigation against a, a private sector company or against the federal government, even lawyers and law firms need to understand the science, the techniques, what the techniques tell us and what the findings mean. So this is important on numerous levels. So the Western blot is a classic technique for uh, measuring and detecting protein. Um, I like to think of um, proteins as uh, the workhorses uh, of our cells. Uh, our cells, our tissues, and our organ systems uh, are, are made up of billions and billions of these, oftentimes specialized. And while uh, the uh, proteins are the workhorses, horses of the cells, as we know, our nucleic acids hold the sequences for 
uh, those uh, workhorses. So when you think about research, particularly in the biomedical sciences, whether it's toxicology, pharmacology, biochemistry, um, some sort of uh, cancer research, microbiology, and so on, at some point, that research, um, the research in those fields is going to involve the need to uh, detect a protein. Um, oftentimes, it's to characterize uh, that protein and to see uh, what role it's playing in uh, human health uh, and or disease. Uh, and so it becomes necessary to characterize and understand that one specific protein. As I described in my live stream, um, in my graduate um, lab, our protein of interest was uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And there are numerous ways to uh, detect protein. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, you can detect protein using a um, high-performance liquid chromatography uh, system or an HPLC. Uh, you can use a 96-well uh, microtiter plate reader to measure uh, protein levels. You can use a mass spectrometer to um, measure alterations in the protein structure itself. That's called proteomics. Uh, but you may just need to look at what's happening to your protein um, in cells, in tissues, and in some instances uh, in vitro. You may want to see over time what's happening to levels of your protein at different time points. Uh, once again, in tissues, could be uh, those could be human tissues, animal tissues, uh, they could be um, in cells, um, or they could be in vitro. So in some instances, it's important to understand what's happening to your protein over time. Is it staying the same in your given system? Is your protein going up or is it going down? Um, and that's um, in it. Those are instances where the Western blot analysis uh, becomes very, very useful. So as just described, my protein of interest was neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And what we were trying to do, you, you can go back and look at previous content to catch up on this, but we were interested in seeing what was happening um, in the cell uh, to our protein after a drug was introduced. Um, we wanted to know what was happening to the protein to, to cause it to degrade or go away at a more uh, rapid uh, rate. So we were interested in the enhanced proteolysis of uh, our protein. Um, so my graduate advisor saw it in a cell and then my job was to uh, look at it in vitro. So if you recall, um, but if you're unfamiliar, when you're doing something in vitro, uh, you're basically putting a number of um, reactants together in a test tube to see uh, what's happening. And so in my instance, we were putting uh, our purified neuronal nitric oxide synthase um, together in a test tube with our protease system and other reactants to mimic the cellular environment to see what would happen to the levels of our protein over time. And that's why it was necessary for me to use uh, the Western blot analysis. Okay, so let's jump into the meat and potatoes of the, uh, the technique. So, again, you could have a tissue that you're interested in um, from a whole organism. You may have, a, uh, you may have conducted experiments in, a, in cell culture. Or, in my instance, uh, I conducted experiments in vitro. But whatever the case, you want to figure out what happened and what's happening to your protein of interest. So um, in my instance, uh, in my experiments, I had a reaction that was going for uh, 90 minutes. So I had time points at 0, 30, 60, and 90 minutes. And what I had to do at each of those time points was I had to take 
uh, a sample out of my major reaction. I don't know if major reaction is the right word to call it, but out of my reaction. I had to take samples out of my reaction, and then I had to quench uh, that sample um, with um, a buffer, um, which consisted of a detergent called SDS, uh, a reducing agent called uh, di diothreatol or DTT, uh, and it had a, uh, a blue dye. So what is the significance of the SDS and the uh, dithiothreatol or DTT? So the SDS, and I didn't mention this, I don't think I mentioned this in my the excerpt that I cut off from my live stream. SDS stands for sodium dodical sulfate. That is a detergent. Okay, so when you think about detergent, think about, in a general sense, laundry detergent or soaps or those kinds of things. Um, and the dithiothreatol is a uh, reducing agent. So what the detergent does is it coats all the proteins um, in that reaction or in that sample um, and it gives it, it gives them a net negative charge. Um, what the DTT does as a reducing agent, um, if you take a look at um, any protein in its native conformation, proteins have a primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase has a native structure. Uh, hemoglobin has a native structure. Um, and they, have, they all have unique uh, folds and conformations. Nature is very smart in that various parts of those proteins are locked together by uh, sulfhydro bonds. So there's an amino acid called cysteine, which has uh, sulfhydro groups. And when that protein is, is synthesized and it starts to fold up, nature knows to lock those sulfhydro groups. What the DTT does is it reduces those and it causes those to break. Okay, so the detergent coats the protein, starts to make it, and it starts to make it break apart. The uh, DTT breaks those sulfhydro bonds, starts to make, and, and starts to make the protein further uh, lose its conformation. And then what you um, would likely also do, depending upon your system and what you're trying to get it to do, is you would probably boil those samples to further get those proteins to uh, denature and lay flat. Um, and also vortex them to get them to lose their conformation and lay flat. That's what I did in um, my system. So you wanna, whatever sample you have, you're gonna add it to a buffer containing SDS, DTT, um, and you're gonna um, attempt to denature those proteins somehow. So you've uh, quenched your samples, you boiled them, uh, you stopped your reactions, and now you want to start to see what has happened to your protein of interest. So now what do you do? Well, now you have to electrophoresis, electrophoresis uh, your samples. So what is um, electrophoresis and what does that mean? Well, the, the, for measuring protein, the entire name is SDS page. Um, uh, SDS page. Sodium uh, dodical sulfate uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Okay, so let's dive into that a little bit. So the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, because we already talked about what the SDS is. You, you're creating a matrix uh, for which to separate out your proteins, okay? And the matrix typically used for looking at protein is uh, polyacrylamide. So all you need to know at this point is that you're um, you, you you're doing a you're, you're performing a chemical reaction um, with, with polyacrylamide, and you're creating a um, a gel. Um, and the gel uh, is basically um, if you go down to the 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 very micro level, it has sieves in it. So depending upon the percentage that you use, the proteins are going to separate out uh, uh, differently 
depending upon their size. So before I go forward, let's talk about the size of the protein. So in my instance, I used um, an in vitro system with multiple proteins in there. Uh, at each time point, I quenched each of those uh, samples with uh, the SDS buffer with the detergent and the uh, reducing agent. And again, what the buffer, the SDS did is it covered every protein, each protein, with a net negative charge. So when you subject those proteins with that same charge uh, to um, uh, electrophoresis, which I'm going to describe shortly, you're going to cause those proteins to migrate based upon uh, size. So they're going to migrate uh, based upon um, their size, and they're going to uh, migrate based upon the percentage of that, uh, that gel matrix. So let's talk about electrophoresis. So what is electrophoresis? So we're going to put our physics and our chemistry hats on just briefly, because those go into the biomedical sciences as well, uh, particularly in the research uh, context. In terms of electrophoresis, you're creating um, an electric field um, around that gel matrix and around your samples. Uh, and so you're going to uh, create, uh, you're going to have a, um, a cathode, which is a negative pole, and an anode at the bottom, which is a positive pole. And as you can, as you recall, all of our proteins were coated um, with a detergent uh, with a negative charge. So once you uh, turn on the electrical field, those proteins are going to start to migrate down towards uh, the anode. But remember, they all have the same charge, so they're going to separate out based upon size. The smaller proteins are going to run out first, and then the larger proteins are going to um, lag uh, behind. So that's um, SDS page. Polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is used for uh, separating proteins uh, 5 to 2,000 kilodaltons. Uh, kilodaltons is a unit for uh, size. And so whenever you run this type of gel, you typically um, want to use a uh, molecular weight standard, which will give you a whole range of proteins. So you'll know or, or you'll have an idea of where your protein of interest uh, is coming out relative to um, those standards. Uh, if you're using a crude system or if you're using an in vitro system with multiple proteins in it like I did, uh, you may want to um, include a standard um, with just your purified protein so you know for sure uh, where your, your protein is in that entire uh, sequence of, of proteins uh, in that particular uh, lane. Now, depending upon what you're looking for, you can actually stop right there um, in terms of running the uh, SDS page uh, gel um, or after the electrophoresis. You can um, run the gel, and the gel, it just, uh, this all takes place in a chamber with buffer and a cooling system and the electrodes. Um, it's, very, it's very cool once you set it up and you watch it go and you've actually mastered the, the technique. But you can stop there. You can um, pull the gel out. Uh, you can stain it with something called Camasi Blue or another stain. Um, and then you can destain the gel and you can actually visualize the proteins that are there. Um, if you have a standard, which uh, my graduate advisor really had to hammer me about, about adding a, a purified standard um, on my gels so we, so we knew where my protein was, if you have a standard and you stain the gel, you could see where your protein of interest is um, in relation to your other lanes. But my point is that you can stop there if that's if you just want to take a quick and dirty picture of your gel or your reactions or what, whatever it is you're looking for. But in some instances, you have to go a step further uh, to uh, perform uh, the Western blot analysis. So for the final stage of your Western blot analysis, what you're going to do is you're going to take your polyacrylamide gel like this. And this is a very, very simplified explanation of it. And you're going to take a nitrocellulose membrane, which is a white membrane, 
um, with very, very specific properties. You, you're going to put them together and then you're going to put it into um, another specialized chamber and you're going to transfer the proteins from your polyacrylamide gel over to the nitrocellulose membrane. Um, the tricky part is making sure that they stay together during the transfer because if they don't, uh, your proteins can come off into the buffer and your entire experiment um, can be ruined. But I'm saying this to say that there's another, uh, the next phase for the Western block is the actual transfer of the proteins from the polyacrylamide gel where we've separated them off, um, we separated them out based upon size. You're transferring those proteins from the polyacrylamide gel over to the nitrocellulose membrane. And now I'm going to talk to you uh, about what happens with the nitrocellulose membrane and how this experiment uh, and this technique uh, concludes. So once you've separated uh, your proteins out and electrophoresed them based upon size, and then you transfer those to uh, a nitrocellulose membrane, what you then do is you take that membrane uh, and you um, block it first with a, a specific buffer uh, solution. And then you use a primary antibody to probe that membrane. So uh, ideally for your protein of interest, because we're looking for one protein, um, ideally you have a nice antibody. Uh, for my experiments, it was a rabbit polyclonal antibody. If I recall correctly, uh, there are also mouse antibodies that are monoclonal. But polyclonal um, means that that antibody can detect multiple epitopes on the protein. So it can detect multiple um, sequences on your protein of interest. The monoclonal antibody can just detect one sequence. So, but the, um, the net net of it is, is that once you transfer your proteins over to that nitrocellulose membrane, now you're probing um, with a, uh, hopefully a good antibody, um, uh, and that antibody is sticking on that nitrocellulose membrane to your protein. Once you've probed that membrane with your primary antibody, now you're going to um, use a secondary antibody which has an affinity for your primary antibody. Now, the reason you're doing this is because there's uh, usually uh, the secondary antibody is going to be the uh, your mode of detection. So for my experiments, uh, we purchased um, a radio labeled uh, secondary antibody, which I believe was goat. I believe it was a goat secondary antibody raised against the rabbit. Um, so um, once the primary antibody is on there, you probe the membrane with the secondary antibody. The secondary antibody attaches to the primary antibody. And um, in my instance, that antibody was um, radioactive. Um, some secondary antibodies uh, you can use in a chemo, uh, luminescence assay or a luminescence assay. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. Um, but in either case, once your secondary antibody is on there, my antibody was my secondary antibody was radioactive. Uh, I was able to dry the membrane out fix it in a certain way in a cassette like this, a big cassette the size of a notebook, and then I had to take x-ray film into a dark room, put that x-ray film on the nitrocellulose membrane with the primary antibody and the secondary radio-labeled antibody on it. I would incubate that x-ray film for a number of hours uh, at minus 80 degrees, and then after a certain period of time I would take it out, take that cassette back into the dark room just like developing um, film at your uh, pharmacy and I would put it into a film developer and then I'd go outside of the hallway and wait for the developer to spit the the film out into the tray and then I'd take the film and take a look at it to see what actually happened and then I'd get a picture just like this uh, which I showed uh, during my um, live stream um, and this is the, the picture this is what a picture of a Western blot analysis with 
a radio labeled antibody looks like. And so as you can see, the first four lanes are one reaction at 0, 30, 60, and 90 minutes. And then the second set is another reaction uh, at 0, 30, 60, and 90 minutes. But that's, um, this is an example of what this technique is and um, what it's used for. It's used for detection uh, of a protein of interest in a, um, in a tissue sample or in a, a cell culture sample or for, for my experiments, um, an in vitro assay. And that's the power of it, is that you can put um, multiple proteins together or you can uh, create a preparation um, from cells or tissues and you can take a nice snapshot of uh, your protein of interest and you can see if that protein is staying the same, you can see if it's going up, or you can see if it's going down. So once again, you can stop right there at taking the picture. You can just put that picture up and look at it and marvel at it. But as we know, with science, uh, science is quantitative. So if you're writing a research paper, like the ones Nicole has talked about and the, like the ones I showed during my live stream, uh, science is quantitative, and you have to show numerically and statistically uh, the effect that you're arguing in that paper in order for people to believe it, and you want to show statistical significance uh, as well. So since I uh, used an I-125 antibody, uh, we could actually um, count uh, the radioactivity uh, which was an indicator of uh, the amount of my protein that was there or uh, the amount of my protein uh, that degraded. Because remember that the primary antibody attached to the protein on the, the membrane and then the secondary antibody attached to the primary antibody. So if there was lots of my protein there on the membrane, there would be lots of counts. Uh, if there was less of my protein there, there would be fewer counts. And if there was no protein, there'd be no counts or there'd, there'd be quote-unquote background, uh, but you can quantify your Western blot. Um, if you're not using an I-125 antibody, you could also uh, scan it to a computer and um, put boxes around each band and measure it that way. My graduate advisor thought that the, the radioactivity would be more quantitative, so I think that if you can get, if you can use radioactive counts, that's, um, that's more quantitative than some form of uh, densitometry. That's what it's called when you, um, uh, I believe that's what it's called when you put the box around uh, the picture uh, of your band or you put a box around a picture of your band and you measure the pixels and the, uh, the density uh, of the image. Um, when I was doing my initial experiments, uh, we were using a uh, program called ImageQuant. So that's what we were doing. We were creating boxes around the protein bands and counting the, the pixels. Uh, my graduate advisor thought that that wasn't very quantitative because there was variability in the sizes of the boxes around those images. So there was no way to control for that. So uh, he thought that counting the radioactivity using a scintillation counter would be the best thing. But these are just ways that, again, you can um, quantify um, your protein levels after you either uh, run a gel and stain it or go ahead and do um, the uh, Western blot. So all that's it. That's a more in-depth look of uh, what the uh, Western blot analysis is. Again, it's a classic technique for uh, protein measurement and detection. Uh, as I mentioned in the opening of this video, there are multiple ways of measuring protein uh, and asking questions about protein, each with its own uh, positives and negatives. And um, each method will tell you certain things, but it won't tell you other things. So you have to uh, pick which method uh, you are going to use. There are other forms of gels, such as agarose gels, which for the most part are used to 
process and detect nucleic acids. Uh, there are also uh, northern blots and southern blots. The, the northern blots are used for de detecting RNA, uh, and the southern blots are used for uh, detecting DNA. Uh, I remember, I recall learning about these things at John C. Smith University in a classroom, but it's it's not until you actually get into a lab and do it day after day and year after year until you actually understand the technique and what it's designed to do and how it works and um, and when something's not working and one of and when one of your reagents is bad or when one of your um, devices is broken. It's not until you actually get into lab and it's not until you actually get into the lab and do it that you actually really really understand it. So I hope uh, someone got something out of this. Uh, if you've watched through to the end and you uh, understood any part of this or if you have any residual questions, please leave those in the description, uh, not the description box, in the comments section below. Speaking of the description box below, if you want to leave a tip in the tip jar, that information is there. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. I'm approaching 1,000 uh, subs. Um, and at that point, I'll have a super chat and a community chat. So I'm going to stop uh, here. Um, once again, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, and as always, remember uh, that your attitude determines your altitude. Take care, and I'll talk to you the next time. Bye-bye.